Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we com Well, don't laugh. That's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compare to experiment or experience. Compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make a difference how smart you are who made the guess or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. It's therefore not unscientific to take a guess, although many people who are not in science think it is. For instance, I had a conversation about flying saucers some years ago with laymen. Because <laughs> I'm scientific, I know all about flying saucers. So I said, I don't think there are flying saucers. So the other, my antagonist said, is it impossible that there are flying saucers? Can you prove that it's impossible? I said, no, I can't prove it's impossible. It's just very unlikely. That, they say, you are very unscientific. If you can't prove it impossible, then why, how can you say it's likely that it's unlikely? Well, that's the way that is scientific. It is scientific only to say what's more likely and less likely and not to be proving all the time possible and impossible. To define what I mean, I finally said to him, listen, I mean that from my knowledge of the world that I see around me, I think that it is much more likely that the reports of flying saucers are the result of the known irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence <laughs> rather than the unknown <laughs> rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. <laughs> it's just more likely, that's all. And it's a good guess. And we always try to guess the most likely explanation keeping in the back of the mind the fact that if it doesn't work, then we must discuss the other possibilities. There was, for instance, for a while, a phenomenon called superconductivity. There still is the phenomenon. Uh, which is that metals conduct electricity without resistance at low temperatures, and it was not at first obvious that this was a consequence of the known laws with these particles, but it turns out that it has been thought through carefully enough, and it's seen, in fact, to be a consequence of known laws. There are other phenomena such as extrasensory perception, which cannot be explained by this known knowledge of physics here. And uh, it is interesting, however, that that phenomenon has not been well established and uh, <laughs> that uh, we cannot guarantee that it's there. So if it could be demonstrated, of course, that would prove that the physics is incomplete and therefore it's extremely interesting to physicists, whether it's right or wrong. and. Uh, Many, many experiments exist which show it doesn't work. The same goes for astrological influences. If it were true that the stars could affect the day that it was good to go to the dentist, <laughs> then, as in America we have that kind of astrology, <laughs> then it would be wrong, the physics theory would be wrong because there's no mechanism by, uh, understandable in principle from these things that would make it go. And that's the reason that there's some skepticism among scientists with regard to those ideas. <laughs> now you see, of course, that with this method we can disprove any definite theory. If you have a definite theory, a real guess from which you can really compute consequences which could be compared to experiment, then in principle we can get rid of any theory. We can always prove any definite theory wrong. Notice, however, we never prove it right. Suppose that you invent a good guess Calculate the consequences and discover that every consequence that you calculate agrees with experiment. The theory is then right? No, it is simply not proved wrong. Because in the future, there could be a wider range of experiments, you could compute a wider range of, co of consequences, and you may discover then that the thing is wrong. That's why laws like Newton's laws for the motion of planets last such a long time. He guessed the law of gravitation, calculated all the kinds of consequences for the solar system and so on, compared them to experiment, and it took several hundred years before the slight error of the motion of Mercury was developed. During all that time, the theory had been failed to be proved wrong and could be taken to be temporarily right, but it can never be proved right because tomorrow's experiment may succeed in proving what you thought was right wrong. <laughs>
So we never are right, we can only be sure we're wrong. <laughs> However, it's uh, rather remarkable that we can last so long. I mean, uh, <laughs> have some idea which will last so long. I must also point out to you that you cannot prove a vague theory wrong. If the guess that you make is poorly expressed and rather vague, and the method that you use for figuring out the consequences is rather a little vague, you're not sure, I mean, you say, I think everything's because it's all due to Muggles, and Muggles do this and that, more or less, so I can sort of explain how this works. Then you see that that theory is good because it can't be proved wrong. <laughs> if the process of computing the consequences is indefinite, then with a little skill, any experimental result can be made to look like a an expected consequence. You're probably familiar with that in other fields. For example, A hates his mother. The reason is, of course, because she didn't caress him or love him enough uh, when he was a child. Actually, if you investigate, you find out that as a matter of fact, she, he did love him very much and everything was all right. Well, then, it's because she was overindulgent when he was a child. <laughs> so by having a vague theory, <laughs> it's possible to get either result. <laughs> now, wait. now, the cure for this one is the following. It would be possible to say, if it were possible to state ahead of time, how much love is not enough and how much love is overindulgent exactly, and then there would be a perfectly legitimate theory against which you can make tests. It is usually said when this is pointed out, how much love is and so on, oh, you're dealing with psychological matters and things can't be defined so precisely, yes, but then you can't claim to know anything about it. <laughs> now, I want to concentrate from now on, because I'm a theoretical physicist, I'm more delighted with this end of the problem, as to what goes or how do you make the guesses. Now, it's strictly, as I said before, not of any importance where the guess comes from. It's only important that it should agree with experiment and that it should be definite as possible, as definite as possible. But you say then is very simple. We've set up a machine, a great computing machine, which has a random wheel in it that makes the succession of guesses. And each time it guesses a hypothesis about how nature should work, computes immediately the consequences and makes a comparison to a list of experimental results that it has at the other end. In other words, guessing is a dumb man's job. <laughs> Actually, it's quite the opposite, and I will try to explain why. <laughs> the first problem is how to start. You see, I'll start, I'll start with all the known principles, but the principles that are all known are inconsistent with each other. So something has to be removed. So we get a lot of letters from people. We're always getting letters from people who are insisting that we ought to make holes in our guesses as follows. You see, you make a hole to make room for a new guess. Somebody says to you, you know, you all, people always say space is continuous, but how do you know when you get to a small enough dimension that there really are enough points in between? It isn't just a lot of dots separated by little distances. Or they say, you know those quantum mechanical amplitudes that you told me about, they're so complicated and absurd. What makes you think those are right? Maybe they aren't right. I get a lot of letters with such content, but I must say that such remarks are perfectly obvious and are, well, are perfectly clear to anybody who's working on this problem, and it doesn't do any good to point this out. The problem is not what might be wrong, but what might be substituted precisely in place of it. If you say for anything precise, for example, in the case of a continuous space, suppose the precise proposition is that space really consists of a series of dots only, and the space between them doesn't mean anything, and the dots are in a cubic array. Then we can prove that immediately is wrong. That doesn't work. You see, the problem is not to make, to change or to say something might be wrong, but to replace it by something, and that is not so easy. As soon as any real definite idea is substituted, it becomes almost immediately apparent that it doesn't work. Secondly, there's an infinite number of possibilities uh, on these, of these simple types. It's something like this. You're sitting, working very hard. You've worked for a long time trying to open a safe. And some Joe comes along who hasn't, doesn't know anything about what you're doing or anything except that you're trying to open a safe. He says, you know, why don't you try the combination 10, 20, 30? <laughs> because you're busy. You're trying a lot of things. Maybe you already tried 10, 20, 30. Maybe you know that the middle number is already 32 and not 20. Maybe you know that, as a matter of fact, this is a five-digit combination that we have. <laughs> so these letters don't do any good, and so please don't send me any letters trying to tell me how the thing is going to work. I, don't, I read them to make sure <laughs> that I haven't already thought of that. But it takes too long to answer them because they usually in the class try 10, 20, 30. 
that you invent a good guess, calculate the consequences, and discover that every cal consequence that you calculate agrees with experiment. The theory is then right? No, it is simply not proved wrong. <laughs> because in the future, there could be a wider range of experiments, you could compute a wider range of, co of consequences, and you may discover then that the thing is wrong. That's why laws like Newton's laws for the motion of planets last such a long time. He guessed the law of gravitation, calculated all the kinds of consequences for the solar system and so on, compared them to experiment, and it took several hundred years before the slight error of the motion of Mercury was developed. During all that time, the theory had been failed to be proved wrong and could be taken to be temporarily right, but it can never be proved right because tomorrow's experiment may succeed in proving what you thought was right wrong. So we never are right, we can only be sure we're wrong. understood what density is. In the same given amount of space, if there are more things, we say that it's denser. Density is simply the measure of how compact the mass in a substance or object is. It's mass per unit volume. And based on this formula, we can say that its unit is kilogram per meter cubed. So can you tell me what relative density is? Look at the word relative. What does it tell you? It tells us that we are looking at the density of something relative to the density of something. We are comparing the density of one thing to the density of another. That's all. But the question is relative to what? It's most typically the density of water. Yes, we look at the density of an object relative to the density of water. How do we define the relative density of a substance? It equals the ratio of its density to that of water. Yes, density of the substance over the density of water. Can you tell me the unit of relative density? Look at the right hand side and tell me the unit. As it is a ratio of similar quantities, relative density will have no units. The units from the numerator and denominator cancel each other out. The density of water is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed and the density of silver is 10,500 kilograms per meter cubed. So can you tell me the relative density of silver? It's easy. Just refer to this formula and try answering it. It will equal the density of silver over the density of water. Substituting the values here, we get the answer as 10.5. That's the relative density of silver. What does the relative density tell us though? What can we understand from this? First, it tells us that silver is a lot more dense than water under the given conditions. Approximately 10.5 times denser. But that's pretty obvious given the numbers. This tells us another important thing. It tells us whether the object will float or sink in water. In simple terms, a substance will sink if it's denser than the liquid it's placed in. And it will float if it's less dense than the liquid it's placed in. How can we say this mathematically? If the relative density of a substance is greater than 1, then it will sink. And if it's lesser than 1, it will float. As the relative density of silver is 10.5, which is greater than 1, it will sink in water. But if we take the example of ice, its density is approximately 934 kilograms per meter cubed. So its relative density will be 0 0.934. As its relative density is lesser than 1, it will float in water. We can understand this with a simple diagram. Take four beakers filled with water. In the first one, drop a substance with a relative density of 0 0.1 you'll see that it floats like this. In the second one, drop a substance with relative density of 0 0.4 and you'll see that it floats like this. More of it is inside the water 
and if it's 0.9, even more of it will be inside the water. But it will still float. And if it's greater than 1, say 1.2 or 1.3, then it will sink. Okay, here's one last question for you. Can the relative density of an object be 0? The answer is no, it can't be 0. Because if the relative density is 0, it will mean that the density of the substance is 0. Which in turn will mean that the mass of the substance is 0. For any given substance, its mass in a given volume cannot be 0. And you should also know that relative density is constant only under given conditions. It is pressure and temperature dependent. The same substance can have different relative densities under different pressures or temperatures.